Um, so today, what I'm going to present is uh, the web platform that uh, at Spill Games uh, we have designed last year. Um, Spill Games has a lot of history, um, but to be very, very short, um, well, he has already introduced me. I'm a passionate Elm developer, and I like testing and a beautiful code over everything. I work for Spill Games. Spill Games is a gaming platform. Um, it's a company in the gaming industry. That means we are not specifically game developers. Actually, mostly we are not game developers. We just publish games. We do develop some games. And uh, we serve data to more than 190 countries worldwide, so it's really worldwide. It's, um, sometimes you just see traffic reports and you get traffic from places that's like, okay, that's fine. And uh, we serve more than 180 million unique users per month. And that's the actual challenge, basically. So that's the, the real difficulty in what we do. We use to serve the games to multiple platforms, so desktop, mobile, also well, native on mobile, and stuff like that. But mainly, our main focus at the moment are the web portals. And we have more than 300 employees, more than 30 nationalities, offices in the Netherlands, a game studio in China, and uh, most of the money is made out of advertising and end user monetization. So this about spill games. Now, um, this is what I'm going to describe like the old portals landscape. So before going into that world, uh, these are a couple of concepts that I'm going to be repeating uh, all along the thing. Uh, the situation we have as spill is not the most common one. So we use the word brand or channel. I'll try to stick to one of them, but I cannot promise you anything um, for targeting the different audiences. So at the moment we have five brands. Uh, teens, families, girls, boys, and women. Um, we m have between 1 and 15 sites uh, pointed to different geographical areas. So sites are language, but not only language. Uh, some type of content tweaking, making it according to the geographical area where the content is going to be shown. And the uh, company policy is also going for strong domains. So that's the reason why we have stuff like spell.se for teens in Sweden, jogos.pt for families in Portugal and Brazil, uh, games.co.uk for families uh, in the UK, girlsgogames.co.uk for girls in the UK. You can see all the pinky stuff. And so these are the basics. Now, technically, how does this work? We have three separated layers, uh, to be as uh, short as and abstract as possible. Um, we have the portals on top. Uh, the portals talk to the application layer, which is the one implementing the business model. So all the logic uh, about the data that we retrieve from the third layer, which is the storage layer. Portals are implementing, um, yeah, just uh, they're just a big monolithic block per brand. And uh, in each one of those brand blocks, there are lots of uh, sites for the different regions. Uh. Portals are mostly static pages with uh, some AJAX calls making the connectivity to the application layer. And uh, the these architecture layers can be developed and can be improved and moved forward uh, independently. So this is what we have been working with for a while. And it had good things. Uh, it allowed us to target independent uh, brands and sites with one specific improvement or one specific new feature. It has provi provided us with uh, acceptable performance, um, a clear layer separation, which is always something really good to have. And thanks to it, we have grown really fast. But, of course, it's really good that you can target one target audience and one specific geographic region with your feature, but it's really bad that when you want to actually put that feature globally in all the portals, you really need to not re-implement it from scratch, but adapt it many times. That's annoying. And uh, I mentioned that uh, we perform acceptably. Yes, that's true, but that's because we have taken very aggressive multi-level caching strategies to make it work. So a couple of memcache layers here and there, CDNs, caching proxies, browser cache. And when you try to make an update, yeah, well, good luck with it. So in case you have a nice isolation in the caches, you can just invalidate and, okay, that should be fine. But uh, 
in case you don't, you cannot invalidate because you don't really know what you're going to flash, so you should not do it. And then it takes like seven hours for the change to propagate, and it's, it's not really under your control. So that's bad. And also, from a development point of view, developers cannot switch brands easily because at a certain point in time, and in order to uh, improve or shorten the time to market uh, for a specific feature for a brand, the code bases for the brands were split. So it did work for that, but now sharing the code or moving a developer from one brand to another is much more difficult, which results in a longer time to market for global features. So one year ago, more or less, we started writing a wish list. So what do we want to do to fix this issue? And uh, there were basically two words that we focused very strongly on. So one of them obviously is performance. And the other one is isolation. So we wanted to have isolated requests. If a request goes wrong and a client uh, sees some error or something, it shouldn't affect requests by other clients. OK, it's a common thing. We also wanted to have isolated crashes. So if something crashes, it should be able to recover without spreading the crash all over the place. That's also good. And the most important of all, we wanted to have isolated features. So not worrying if I put out this new feature that I have proven that works beautifully, what am I going to break in the rest of the portal? That's something that we really wanted to run away from. Okay? So I put something new, either it works or it doesn't, but it doesn't break the, the rest. We wanted to have feature toggling on runtime to prove IDS, um, being able to fix the errors quickly, and of course, perform decently again. So this is number of requests per second. And the most important, even if you don't have the most top of the line throughput or whatever, being able to scale linearly. So that's with supermarket hardware, no need of uh, extra powerful killing machines. You know, just normal stuff, being able to put more machines in the rack and just make it work. And since the application and the storage layers we have already migrated to Erlang, well, guess what? But our task force also had some wishes and some stuff that they wanted to accomplish. Like, they were tired, of course, of the different uh, code bases. So what they wanted is only one code base as modular as possible. So everything is shared, and if I need to do something that's very specific for this site, then I can do it, but the rest is the same. And that's a good thing. Wanted to be able to prove or test their ideas by creating small features with uh, very little code uh, that are easy to deploy and to roll back. And they wanted to be able to test those changes and those features in isolation from the rest of the portal. So before we started going crazy and typing, which is what we like, uh, we decided to think. It's always a good idea. So we took a look at the frameworks out there the main ones in Ireland that we found were Sotonic and Chicago Bros. And uh, both of them, different, completely different implementations, but uh, share a lot of concepts, like a very nice layer separation. Um, and there are mature solutions. There are companies using them. Um, we wouldn't be the first, so it wouldn't be exactly a trial. They're easy to use. I mean, when I watch... Uh, talk about Chicago Bells in the Erlang factory in San Francisco, I, I was really amazed. It's really, really easy to start using Chicago Bells and building stuff on it. But feature isolation was not a key on the design. Uh, it's something that we really wanted, and uh, it's not really a concept that comes together with those frameworks. You can do it, of course, but it doesn't come naturally. And uh, second argument, we don't need a model view controller framework. We only need a view controller. Because we have the model abstracted in a different layer. So we don't want to re-implement. We don't even want to touch our model. Our model is fine. We just want to talk to it. So we decided to come up with a widget platform. And uh, naming is not what we do best. So what is a widget? Um, this is an image of one of our portals. And what we have done here with these pink lines is uh, separating different areas which provide independent functionality. So for example, here you can see uh, a list of the most played games 
so a ranking. Here a list of suggested games, um, popular games. Uh, the upper part, just on top, you can see the header with some logo and some links and some user information right up here. So high score, username, status, stuff, search bar. Now each one of those boxes is a widget and it's independent from the rest. And that's the whole point that we're trying to make here. So if the Wi-Fi allows me, I'm gonna try to show you um, how it actually works. So this is a portal running on my computer. Um, let me see, let me see. Okay, so this is the actual portal. It seems to be working. So I showed you before this one on the right, this list of uh, ranking of most played games. So it's a completely independent part of the page. That's the whole point of it. So as a completely independent part of the page, I could just switch it off. So that's what I'm gonna do. So if I now retry my request, just that part of the page is gone. And it doesn't affect the rest. It's just that small part of the page is different. Okay, now I can come up and Start it again. And it is back. So this is feature isolation. But I talked also about crash and error isolation. So let me actually show you that. Everybody could see that? Yeah? So. Okay. So if I press F5 now, it will look like the widget is disabled. Well, sorry, this is what I mentioned about the Wi-Fi, so now you saw this one timed out in the backend to retrieve the information, I can just retry. Yeah, so what you just see is this area missing from the page. Why? Because there was a crash in it, it exploded, but it never propagated to the rest of the page. So it's just this part here is broken, I just broke it. Mm. So that's error isolation. Uh, let me quickly fix it. Okay, so that's the idea. Now the components for this are um, widgets. Each one of the widgets is an independent Erlang application. And I mentioned that we decided not to go for Sotonic, not for Chicago Bus, but that doesn't mean that we can't use some things. Early DTL is a very nice thing that is inside uh, Chicago Bus. It's a templating system. Uh, you're familiar with uh, Django for Python. This is a port of Django for Erlang. It's 95, 99% compatible. And the stuff that is not the same, well, you can tweak it. So each one of these widgets, when you request a page, now imagine, for example, you're requesting a search page. And uh, the search page is this guy over here, widget one. But the search page has a search bar and uh, search results, for example, yeah? So when you perform the request, the request will come from the top, will enter the first widget, which is the search page. And the search page will have two children, which are these guys over here. And in this case, these guys will have no more children. So this is your tree. This is a tree representing your page, a tree with three widgets, one top level entry point, and two children, yeah? Now each one of the widgets has exactly the same stuff and it must specify it all. Otherwise, anything that's not clearly specified in the widget will not be possible to use it from the widget. That's also one design concept that we wanted to apply. So 
let's try not to avoid crazy development of features and adding stuff and hacking here. Everything must be declared somewhere. If you don't declare, you will not be able to use it. So for example, each widget has public properties. These public properties are stuff that modifies the behavior of the widget. For example, if this one is a search result, that could be, for example, um, a public property saying I want uh, four rows with uh, five results per row. Okay, and each one of those could actually be overwritten by the parent. So that, that's the meaning of public. Your, your parent widget can actually change your behavior, right? Based on anything that it detects on runtime. But there are also private properties, and private properties is ev any variable that affects the behavior of the widget, anything where you are gonna put an if in your template or a for loop, any variable that you're gonna pass in there, yeah? You must declare it either as a public property or as a private property, because if you don't, the widget will never be able to render that template, and that's by design. So you will be able to catch the error really early. If you don't declare it, it will not work. But apart from that, um, well, of course, these public and private properties will be declared with default values. Uh, that makes sense. But we also are able to define brand and site specific default values. So by default, unless my parents specify otherwise, I want to show five, uh, res five rows of four results per row, unless I'm in the Turkish portal for teens where I want uh, three rows with five results, for example. Yep. And, uh, Widgets can also specify some decoration needs. So I'm not gonna lie to you, all you saw on that uh, browser is not Erlang, okay? There is some CSS there, and there is some JavaScript there as well. So we try to minimize the use of JavaScript to just tweaking the stuff that you cannot do from the backend, so enriching the user experience. But uh, still, you, you're gonna need some stuff. So the widget must declare what they need, Erlang configuration, the easiest way of parsing it, and uh, this configuration will not be accessible on any server the widget is running. I have some specific overwritten values for teens, in this case, for this brand. I want a specific CSS and a specific JavaScript. For a widget, you're gonna use these type of specs and you need to export these functions. Provides wrapper for common actions, like for example, the horrible work of parsing this stuff. You know, you don't have to do it. <laughs> there are already wrappers for it. And uh, it provides a way to make nice and simple calls to the application layer. So if a widget is so stupid that it cannot access the model directly, because it shouldn't, if you have a business layer logic in the middle, business logic layer in the middle, um, that way of communicating is also abstracted in a library. So the widget can just make a call, get the results, and don't care if the call is HTTP or RPC or whatever you can come up with. Yeah, it will be abstracted. And also, these libraries provide some stuff for the view, so early DTL custom tags, which means you can actually write, specific, write your own early DTL commands that you can put on your template to do stuff that is not exactly defined in the original early DTL. For example, generating translated links. It's a very repetitive action that you don't want to do every time in your widget. Every time you generate the link, you want to generate the translated or the localized version of the link. So you just use a specific tag for it, your code becomes super simple. Now all these widgets live in one place. They, they do live in a platform, the widget platform. And this platform contains all the widget dependencies, shared libraries for logging, shared libraries for monitoring, all you can think of. Contains the path to widget mapping which means when I request slash, slash search, I should go to widget page search, which will have two children, which will be the search bar and the search results. That path uh, matching is really relevant, and it's depending on the platform. It contains the Erlang web server, which is a cowboy web server, and it implements the request flow and the global error pages. So why the global error pages are not widgets in this case? Because what happens, I mean, for what reason would you want to show a 500 error? Well, internal server error, or something went wrong. Well, if something went wrong with your server, how the hell are you gonna generate your dynamic page, right? So it's a static page. 
And we just have one very thin layer on top, which is Nginx. So why do we have Nginx on top of a Cowboy server? Because it allows us to define the servers. So the domain mapping, meaning if I go to spell.c and if I go to uh, juegos.com, the Spanish portal, uh, they are both for teams. So they are both served by the same platform, which is in that cluster over there. So that the domain, defi that server definition, virtual host definition, you do with Nginx. And since you have Nginx anyway, Nginx will serve the static files, because it's really good at it. And so static error pages are static files as well. And in your virtual host definition, you probably need to indicate to your platform to what from what domain you come from, some brand ID, some site ID. So Nginx can do some very basic URL rewriting. So how does this look like? Request comes in for a path slash search with a query string search term cats. Then does the path match an existing file? Yes, okay, then Nginx will serve it. This line here is the frontier. Now, it is if it's not a static file, immediately Nginx redirects it to the widget platform. The widget platform will first translate the slash search to the widget that is supposed to handle it. So widget and the query string. This query string is kept because it's the way to affect the public properties of the first level widget, since the first level will have no parent. Yeah. So it will build the widget tree representing the page. In this case, page search, search bar, save results. This widget tree will be rendered, which will result in some IO data and some decoration needs, the stuff that we mentioned before. Now, if there is a need for decorating, well, first of all, if there's not a need for decorating, like, like I'm just typing my first widget, creating some stuff, I just wanna check the HTML that gets generated, see if it looks okay, I will take care of uh, making it beautiful later, then we're done just return the response. Otherwise, you need to use all these decoration requests, organize them in a nice way, and build something that is not just a bunch of HTML tags, but something that's actually a page, you know, with HTML, head, body, stuff. So this is what the decoration tree does. So you can see it as a sort of a two-step two rocket. First, you render all the stuff behind your page and uh, the tree corresponding to the page will declare all the needs that are there. Then if you need to make it beautiful, to make it look like a website, then it's a very short second step that picks all those needs and make them available in the web page. So this second tree is rendered, then you get some IO data that is served to the client. Um, but we also wanted to solve the problem of deployment. I promise you quick deployment and quick releasing. So how do we take care of it? Wanted to be able to create easily small deltas. So I have my configuration here, my set of widgets running on my production machine. I just want to make this teeny tiny change, you know, should be quick. And uh, we want to arrange different sets of widgets in running on the same hardware. So I'm gonna test this directly on the production servers. I wanna test it myself on the production servers, but I don't want my clients being experienced in the test themselves, because maybe I'm testing because it's buggy, right? So I wanna test how that works in the real installation without making it public for the rest of the world. So different sets can be built per request. So let me show you another thing now. So one of the things that you're seeing here is, uh, I talked to you before about this, this different blue app, yeah, this different blue gradient is just one widget which contains several stuff, like uh, for example, this other thing uh, with the logo and these links and the search bar and the user information box, yes? Now, what I'm gonna do is just add some parameters to the query string because in the same 
Erlang VM, which is running here. It's exactly this Erlang VM. I have two different sets of widgets running. And by default, it will always serve me one of them. But I can create these small deltas like I have. So I have a different version of this logo thing here running. And uh, I can make a request that serves the full page from the main set of widgets, except this small delta that I want to see how it looks. Okay. So I can actually request this other one. And you see now it has a different positioning. It's the, the logo has gone to the middle and has a different color of the text. Now it's just a slightly different. I'm requesting the same domain. Just I'm specifying that this widget header logo has to come from a different set, a set that I call Teams Preview. Yeah? So. So this is how we make that. Inside the same Erlang virtual machine, we have one master node and several slave nodes. You can configure as many as you want. Now, the master node will be running the Cowboy web server, taking care of the requests. We'll be running a management interface, which you will be able to use uh, to see the list of slaves that you have available, the, so each, yeah, the list of slaves you have available, the, the versions of the widgets that are running, etc. And the master node will, of course, be running one specific set of widgets, which will be the main one, the one that will be returned unless you specify otherwise. But now, in each one of those slaves, you will run a whole specific set of widgets that might differ, actually. What I just showed you, just one different, that small logo widget is a different version. So I can make requests like this, and if I specify, well, I want these customized origins for widget 1 and widget 5, and I want them from the preview node, when the tree of widgets corresponding to the page is being built, this one will be served from the preview, and this one will be served from the preview, while the rest are coming from the master node. So this means widgets can be called in any node. By default, they will always come from the master node because they're running locally there. But if you specify something different, inside the same VM, you have this slave with a different version. It might be just off. And... Uh, it will RPC that slave to get the result of rendering that specific widget. So you can create specific deltas and test them completely isolated. Now, in this case, for example, if widget 5 was disabled in preview, you just see the whole tree without this thing. If widget 3 was disabled in master, you'll see this big area disappearing from the page. Yes? So you can point or target to specific subtrees when you enable disable widgets. All right, so you have one master and several slaves and lots of set of widgets and can be different versions. So this requires quite some management to make, him make it right. So we also realized that. And we realized we needed an automatic managing system. So First of all, so we could actually change the versions in an easy way, create the deltas that we want, test exactly what we want to test, and second, keep the cluster platforms synchronized together. And if you have three of these platforms for teams running on the same physical hardware cluster, um, you probably have a load balancer in the front that is redirecting your HTTP request to one of the machines behind. Now, if you have different sets of widgets in those three thingies, you cannot predict what the client is going to see, which is something that you don't want. You want to, in the same cluster platforms, have exactly the same view from the external point. So to make those changes in a uniform way, we need this manager thingy. So before going in detail, let me actually show you what it is. The manager is this. So this small web application here allows me to select all the environments that are running. Now I have two brands running on this laptop. One of the brands is Teams. The other brand is this SIBO thing, which is a brand for women. doesn't matter. So I have two nodes inside Teams. 
the master node, which is Teams main, and the preview node, which is Teams preview. So for example, here I could just disable I don't know, widget header, for example. So this one, if I just set it off, and now I come to my page, which is here, the header is just gone. You see the add on top, there's no header. Yeah, so it is that simple. You have this graphical tool where you can click around, switch the versions, not only on and off. I mean, you will be able to switch it to a completely different version. Right, stuff like this. Now I enable this other version, which is a slightly different. Yes? So this is the tool. Now the implementation of the tool is, of course, an Erlang application as well and uh, has an HTTP interface, as you have just seen, and it talks to this thing here that we have by side called Swift. Swift is uh, distributed binary storage from OpenStack. And we use it to store the widget releases. So every time you release a widget you create, you make a release out of it, you just store the binary in there. So this corresponds to widget header one, two, three, and you put it there. Then the manager, every time you open it, will actually go to Swift, retrieve the list of widgets that are available, go to the connected widget platforms, check what they have enabled, and show you that interface where you can actually choose and switch versions and stuff. So that's already cool. And via this router library in here, the widget manager can talk Erlang to Erlang, native Erlang to these platforms, and be aware if one of them dies. So if this guy dies, you have your client traffic coming from here, as long as your load balancer is informed so you don't address more client traffic in here, you're still able to work both from the client side and from the management side of it. You can actually keep performing changes, keep deploying widgets in these two guys that are alive. Yeah. Now, one of the coolest features of the manager is, in case you decide to do that, what happens when this guy comes alive again? You have performed a couple of changes via the manager while this one was dead, you change this, you change this, right, different sets of widgets, and now this one is offering a different view to the client. Well, the manager is responsible to realizing when a new platform is about to join an already existing cluster, and in that case, the manager reads the list of widgets that are running in one of the machines in the cluster, for example, this one, and enforces that configuration to the member that is joining the cluster. So, hey, you're joining this group, this group has this config, I don't care what you want, this is the config you're gonna have. Yeah? And then the client always sees the same. And this is extremely important because doing this by hand, if you have an accident or some, some server goes down, you have to keep going with one server less. Then if you have to go and check how many things I have changed in the last 24 hours and just replay it, it's an enormous waste of time. And the manager just does it for you. It's completely transparent. You can just take it down for maintenance if you want and put it back. And it will automatically revive to the correct state. All right, so where are we going now? What's in the future for us? Well, we have learned a lot while developing this thing. So one of the most important things is reinforce the adoption of the concepts. So. This is not about technical details. How do I implement this particular thing over here, very low level? It's about refreshing the concepts and explaining the concepts one and again and discussing them as many times as possible. Because, yes, I mean, even if you have uh, a developer that is not really feeling comfortable with uh, the stack that you are providing or the architecture that you are providing, if he understands the concept, um, when he starts typing, if he's going in the wrong direction, he will have this feeling of, I don't know what I'm doing, but it doesn't really feel right. Uh, this is important because otherwise he will go forward with the solution, eventually someone will find out what was the solution, will dislike it, wasted work, angry workers, you don't want that. Okay, so just keep insisting on the concepts first and review, review everything. Review the code 20 times, 50 times, keep reviewing. And especially when you think the concepts are very clear, then review. 
because if you do that, not only you will make sure that you were right and the concepts were clear, but it's that reviewing, the one that provides you very, very, very good value. Like that reviewing is the one, when someone understands it all and does something that is weird for you, then is where you really have to look at it because probably it's having a good idea. You know? There's something there that you didn't see and he saw. So keep reviewing and measure performance from as early as possible. One of the very funny things, and I'm just uh, about to finish, uh, that happened during this thing is um, the first time we measured this super scalable widget platform with fully dynamic pages. Uh, we're really happy, you know, typing our performance test, the concurrency, and we got the amazing number of 2.6 requests per second. <laughs> and that was like, really? Really? What are we doing? Well, in the end, uh, it was a matter of a very stupid thing. So just in case you find out, uh, always check code is loaded is a very good thing. Code which is a very evil thing. Um, code which, if the code is not loaded, before returning you false, will scan all your folders in the code path physically before telling you no. So yeah, that's really evil if you do that per request. And yeah, after that, in a laptop like this, uh, we can serve at the moment 670, something like that, concurrent requests per second. Uh, it's more than enough. So coming in H2, native widget to backend connectivity. At the moment, the widgets are requesting the application layer stuff via HTTP. They are both Erlang, right? So let's do it in Erlang. Just want to define a stricter interface to do that nicely. Um, want to define per widget render timeouts. So specify each one of the widgets in the tree. If it takes you more than two seconds to get all the information you need to render, just shut up and disappear. Yeah. And caching the requests for the backend calls, for the calls to the application layer. Maybe in the tree you have two or three widgets doing the same call. Don't perform the call several times. Even though when you branch all the calls, so all the widgets in different branches are rendering parallel, um, just don't perform the call. You don't need to do it, right? So just cache. And uh, keep improving the performance. And very interesting thing, you can come talk to me if you're interested uh, later. I will not explain it in detail, but this router library that I mentioned here is the same router library that I mentioned in previous talks about the storage layer of Spill Games. We're going to open source this library in the uh, second part of the year. And it's a very nice library to keep your Erlang cluster connected only with the connections that you're interested in instead of keeping a fully connected graph. This is the stuff that we have used. Everything is clickable. When the slides are online, you can just go there, check it out. Um, stuff with stars are pull requests that we have submitted upstream uh, with extra things. And yeah, that was it. So now it's time for you to ask me stuff. Yes, please. Yes? Oh, that's because my private browser you tends to access or probably has a lot of cookies from uh, the Netherlands. That's, that's the only point. Yes? Well, at the moment, you can specify a timeout per call in a widget. So when the widget makes a um, uh, backend call, you can specify, well, after that, just time out. And the call will error, and the widget can manage the error. But instead of letting the widget manage the error of the call that actually timed out, we want to manage that in a platform level. So I don't care what the widget is doing. The widget should be as small, as stupid as possible. You know, Just program the widget for a happy flow. And if it crashes or it, the render call, whatever is doing, just times out, um, I don't care, just don't show it. So move that logic of, well, when I call the backend, I am too slow. Um, move that logic to the platform. So for example, if you have a widget that doesn't use, use any backend, but it has a, I don't know, four level, four loop in the template or some super crazy stuff like that that will be damn slow, um, just the platform takes care of shutting the widget down. That's the point. More. Yeah. 
we have one VM with obviously one shell that you're seeing, but we also have slaves with slave start inside the same VM. And those are just running different sets of widgets. So different s versions of a list of applications inside the same VM. <coughs> 